Welcome everybody to New Polities Podcast. We are fresh off the conference and excited to uh, have Josiah Lott in the studio today. In part, we started to meet a number of people that converted to, I guess, further into Catholicism yeah, from yeah. the alt-right. And there was a number of them at the conference and we thought, well, why, why is that? And so we wanted to sit down with you and figure out little bit about why that is the church yeah. typically only figures out things like a couple of years after they've happened so like the, <laughs> the vatican just did an art show recently where they were like had certain art pieces that were nfts as like the actual value of nfts is like plummeting <laughs> in a similar sense now that nobody talks about the alt-right anymore we're here to talk about the alt-right <laughs> Right Not on the, schedule. We, we don't even know what it is, actually. We were hoping, <laughs> I kind of, whenever I think about it, I think about the keyboard. Like, you know, there's the alt. You have to there's hit alt, alt and yeah. then something, you know. Is that actually where it comes from? So alt-right, I believe, I'm not totally. So I was never got into, by the time I was into far-right politics online, it was no longer called the alt-right. Um, it was a series of, like, scattered different movements. Um, the one I was most involved with was called America First. Um. And um, by the time I was out, you know, converting out of it, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, I was in like a, a much further right position that doesn't actually really have a name. Um, it's just you, you end up in one of these like smaller groups of like Illuminati. a dozen or so. Yeah. So well, it does seem to me, maybe I'm wrong on this, that the alt right thing came early enough as a description of some far right movements that made it seem clear to me that it was like a liberal name to collect them and then so that's, reject them. That as... is kind of, well, that's where it is now. Okay. Um, I believe at the beginning and I'm going to get this wrong and people are going to be mad about it in the comments and my internet the... friends are going to text me and tell me how stupid I am. That's the only way to live. Just say, so. yeah, I mean, it's great. <laughs> um, um, from what I remember, actually, originally it was a name taken on like the, um, the guys in the alt right who were like guys like um, Andrew Breitbart and Milo Yiannopoulos mm -hmm. um, and like uh, Patrick Casey's and those guys uh, took it on as their like did take on the moniker. Um, and then at a certain point, it became it became an insult um, mm -hmm. for anybody that was right of like, you know, Lindsey Graham, you sure. know, if you were if you wanted more government involvement and you were right wing, like it was perfectly fine in political conversation to want more government involvement and be left wing. It was mm -hmm. perfectly fine to be libertarian and be right wing. It was perfectly fine to be libertarian and be left wing. But if you wanted more government involvement and you were right wing, that was all right. And that was evil. And so all right became just this insult. Yeah. It is funny how that goes. It's like, like I want to teach children the LGBT philosophy. It's like, great. Bring the state in to do it. And then, but then if you have some kind of like right wing equivalent, it's like you're fascists. Yeah. It seems to me. <laughs> that that is that. often how it's um how well, how that happens. So the alt right kind of died out mid twenty seventeen. Um so now it's just the main movement that's um like nationalist populist politics that's yeah. appealing to young men is called America First. The leader of that movement's named Nicholas Fuentes. So So I mean, this is a new movement. I mean, pretty much this is something that arose during the 20 teens of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. The alt-right came about during um, the Republican primaries in 2015. Um, it's just um, mostly around supporting Trump. Um, this is when you have the um, some of the college tours, like Milo Annopolis' uh, college tour that he did um, during the 2016 election, which that was I won't, wild. Yeah. which I won't name the name of the tour. If you want to look it up, you can, but I won't name the name of the tour because we will get flagged by YouTube because <laughs> <laughs> there is a slur in the title. <laughs> but, um, but I bring up that it's kind of recent to say that yeah. if you are part of it, then you've converted into it. Yeah, so, yeah. So how did you get into it? Um, so... During the 2016 election, um, and kind of through the couple of years that I was in college um, before I dropped out, um, smart man. I was uh, no, that's not that was the, the problem. Was that's not why I dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> the problem was being a dumb man is why I had to drop out. Um, um, during the couple of years I was in college, I was just like a milk toast Ben Shapiro conservative, for lack of. I mean, it's like 
sort of neoconservative, but more um, concerned about um, social things because I was a faithful Catholic. I converted in 2012. I never, you know, even through all of this, there was never a point where I was not practicing, Mm -hmm. at least going to mass on Sundays. Um, But um, so at a certain point um, in late 2019, an event that happened in real life, but for all intents and purposes for understanding my um, entrance into um, America First and the far right, and for most guys who uh, viewed this and and were affected by it, it happened online. Um, what happened is Charlie Kirk, who runs Turning Point USA, um, still does, <clears throat> was doing a college tour, and he was calling the college tour Culture War. Um, but a lot of his guests, so he was he he was doing a speech, and then there'd be a Q and A. Well, he was doing a speech, and then there'd be a shorter speech by a different guest for each um, appearance, and it was all on college campuses. Um, and a lot of these guests were, I mean, just frankly not living conservative values or even you know Christian values in life. But Charlie Kirk's out here saying like he's leading this culture war on college campuses, right? Right. Conservative being the whole Russell Kirk, um, you know, I ideas have consequences, that sort of like good, positive, conservative, yeah, like yeah. has a good flavor of Christianity in it. Well, for, as an example, the, the first time, so what happened was a bunch of, um, a, a, at the time, Nick Fuentes was a relatively small compared to Charlie Kirk. Um, but um, some of his fans, and I forget what the first university they went to was, but the first one that made like people started to notice was at Ohio state. Um, Charlie Kirk's guest host or co-host for this particular event was a man named Rob Smith. Um, and Rod Smith was a gay Christian conservative. Um, and so these young guys, um, who they would all show up. So Charlie Kirk would have these Q and A's and he was expecting it to be like the 20 teens, mid 20 teens, um, Q and A's where like college socialists come up, they ask midwit or mid middle brow level questions. Mm-hmm. Charlie Kirk destroys him. He gets his internet clip. He gets his hits. More people give him money. Donors think, oh, this guy's making a difference in college communities. They give him money. <laughs> the best, problem was he. Grift. The problem, yeah, it's a great grift. We should get in on that one day. Yeah, I tried it once, but it really bombed. It, I'm sorry, <laughs> man. Right, out, right out the gate. <laughs> And the way he would, the, the method about which he went this by this was, now we're going to take questions. If you disagree with me, you can come to the front of the line. Mm. So people who disagreed with him from the right were like, cool, I disagree with you. You know, you've got a, an openly gay man, a man who's married to another man on the stage. How is that helping us win the culture? That's not the phrasing of the question. Yeah. Um, but it was it was a rather vulgar question for shock value because the mm-hmm. questions were not so much about having Charlie Kirk give serious answers. They were about pointing out to Charlie Kirk's fans and people who were watching that Charlie Kirk wasn't seriously or a or real conservative in these young men's eyes in this this other group mm-hmm. in America First size. Mm-hmm. He was supportive of things like foreign wars, which America First and a lot of these far right uh, populist movements are in definitely not in support of. He was, um, one of the things that he got lambasted for most is he would talk about, um, acceptance of homosexuality in a country as sign of that country being like a, like a a virtuous or like a a modern country that we Mm -hmm. should be viewing as like democratic and in, in the American sphere. Yeah. Um, and so these guys would, you know, come to these events and ask him questions that were not really questions. They were more designed to point out to people watching, this guy is not conservative. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I started seeing this thing. I, I saw the Ohio State event. Um, there was also one at University of Virginia. Um, and there's one at University of Florida. And they got more chaotic as they went because Charlie Kirk and Turning Point were making more efforts to try to not allow these questions to be asked mm. because they looked very bad. Um, and also as the college tour went on, more and more people who were previously fans of Fuentes and America First or who were just now becoming fans so started <coughs> going to these events um, 
and cheering for the questioners against Charlie Kirk or booing Charlie Kirk during his speeches, because a lot of his speeches went from being about just general talking points to trying to do damage control for whatever he got roasted um, on at the last event. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there was one event where somebody pointed out that he said we should staple green cards to every college diploma. And then <laughs> somebody walks up and asks, like, how is that? Shouldn't we care for American students before we care for, you know, students outside of America? And so then at the next event, he does his entire monologue is trying to explain this position. Mm. And so his, his tour slowly fell apart as he tried to suppress the questions and the questioners and, and drag them through the mud. And um, so as somebody who... I mean, I mean, even these conservatives, they claim they were anti-cancel culture, pro-free speech, pro-questioning. The Kirk type of the conservatives. The Kirk, yeah. Shapiro. But, yeah. but they were explicitly taking actions that were against this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, um, one of the speakers for, at the same time, Young Americans for Freedom was doing a tour. I forget what the title of the tour was. But Michelle Malkin was one of the speakers they had hired to do an event at a college campus. And she came out and instead of, you know saying that these people were awful or they or they thought things that were unacceptable in polite society, she came out and said, you know what, these are legitimate questions. They've got legitimate concerns. Um, and we're not cancel culture, so we should be answering them. And the fact that Shapiro and Kirk and these guys won't answer it is evidence that they haven't thought through it, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was taken off of the Young Americans for Freedom's ambassador list for not... Wow. So... I, at this time, began to start to think of like, well, if I'm actually pro-free speech, if I'm actually pro like asking questions and these guys are blocking this because the thing that they always say is, you know, I mean, I also used to listen to a lot of Dave Rubin and they would always say like, whatever the, you know, the crazy leftists don't want you to talk about or ask about, that's probably what you should be paying attention to. And I was like... I'll apply the same principle to you guys. So I went and started looking into this America first far right thing. And mm-hmm. that's how I got into it. And once, once you were in, what was the, like the main values that you saw were celebrated and pushed within the community? Um, it was a lot about being proud of American heritage and America as a country. Um, but beyond just like the base level American exceptionalism that you mm-hmm. find in neoconservative circles, it was like, uh, it was, it was very much, um, like one of their main policy positions that they still hold is um, a total immigration moratorium. Oh, um, wow. And so it was more about, it was it was very populist, um, protecting America. Um, it's explicitly pro-white um, for, you know, not so much like anti-other races, but it's pro-white because they view um, the establishment as being anti-white. Um, so I began to... That's a, that's an you know a fine distinction I I suppose but yeah um I'm, but you often you, you, I guess I, I don't hear that really it's oftentimes that the far right has actually gone to elevate the superiority of the white community white race all that as yeah well. one of the main um for lack of a better word internet celebrities in America mm-hmm. first right now is a guy named John Miller and he's um half African American he's I mean explicitly endorsed by Nick Fuentes, the guy who's in charge, and he explicitly endorses Nick Fuentes. And he actually lost his job with Blaze TV, from my understanding, for this support. Mm. So, Okay. Well, that's so um, fair distinction then, I suppose. These America First guys, they're not explicitly um, like racist. Um, they just want their people to also be cared for in the way that the regime cares about the minority communities, mm-hmm. I guess is the best way to understand it. Um, and that stuff was really attractive to me. Um, because you're white. Because I'm white. And you and identify be- as being white. I, I do. Okay. I, I do. Right. I do currently yeah. identify as being white. That is, that was really attractive to me because <clears throat> even like the neocon milk toast, right. Um, and what America first called them was uh, the con anchors, conservative anchors. Um, nice. They would even say things like, you know, this affirmative action is a problem because it's, you know, it's, you know, I mean, even today, even years down the line, you hear them talking about CRTs, critical race theory as a problem because it's anti-white racism, right? Um, But they won't go as far as to say, you know, and you should support your people that just say that we should just be generally equal across all groups. And so at the time I started to realize that the logical conclusion of 
or, or I, th I started to believe rather that the the logical conclusion of all this was that I should, or, or that it was okay for me to like my people and my history and and my country and and not and and I started to gain the impression that nobody, Republican or Democrat, um, was actually in favor of this was actually okay with this, no matter how much one side or the other might say. So they, the, in practice, they didn't do anything. So, right. yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't know if this is time for comment. I hate to interrupt your glory story. <laughs> oh, you should interrupt at every chance you get. Otherwise I'm just going to monologue about <laughs> my weird internet days. <laughs> you know, <laughs> here I am on a podcast complaining about weird yeah. internet days. <laughs> like, just, you're just contributing to other people's weird internet days, right? Like, I don't know. This is the podcast that people do while they're working, community oriented blue collar jobs. Correct. It actually shuts off as, if you're not. as somebody who listens to this while doing community. Well, no, that's not true. I don't listen. I listen to this in the in the sound room. <laughs> as somebody who used to listen to this while doing that, that's true. Um. Well, it's just always seemed to me this interesting thing about critical race theory and um, what's left unquestioned. So often in, at New Polity, we're kind of looking at underlying structures or underlying metaphysical assumptions, right? And it seems like what's not questioned, whether you hate critical race theory or you love critical race theory, is the basic presumption of society as um, being full of competing individuals because even the social relations even when they're valued um they're always considered as um extrinsic so they're relations that the individual who is the real unit of society is involved in enters into um and otherwise flourishes through but the point is at the end of the day you can reduce society to people all trying to get what they want and everything is a um <sighs> way of um, mitigating conflicts in order to maximize individual self-interest. Now, why, why does this matter? Well, because it seems like the, the actual difficulty that critical race theory has, that, that it's had, has been the, I don't know if it's accidental, it just seems like it is a natural consequence that it produces racists because, um, and I mean it in the sense that they mean racists, not like not like the conservative critique, like you're being reverse racist or whatever. That's, no, that's, yeah, that's it, silly. It, yeah. What I mean is they say, okay, here is this, um, here's the structural racism in society, which means as a black person, I lose. Right. And then they appeal to a principle of equity whereby through government and also just through personal, um, like almost evangelical conversion on the part of white people who have that power, they advocate for the um, essentially the giving up of that power, the denial of it, or not denial of it, the acceptance of having that power, and then the willful bowing of that power to oppressed minority communities. Um, but they don't question the underlying paradigm. So what this leads to is people saying, I as an individual am not flourishing because of this structural racism. And you should suffer in order to help me flourish. But since the paradigm is unquestioned, all it does is says, okay, actually this person is just going to say no. Like I'm, I'm after my individual flourishing. The whole premise is that we're in competition and we're negotiating scarce resources. And all you're pointing out is that I'm winning and you want me to lose. <coughs> and I've seen this happen with guys that, that the, they hear the whole thing. And then it just, because there's no reason for equity beyond like the power struggle there's no like appeal to something christian there's no appeal to a uh, justice that we should we should be just in how we distribute land and power and property because we're all part of the church for instance or some yeah. unifying principle instead it's just like well why would i why would i in a world of competing individuals practice this goal of equity why would i do that you're saying that we're in a war of all against all and I'm winning and you're losing and we should switch positions. You know what I mean? Like, so you can see where the racism just becomes a reaction. Well, and, and guys who buy into that paradigm that I say guys, cause this happens online mostly with young men. It rarely happens with young women. Um, they have two choices. If they buy into that paradigm, either no, I refuse to be on the losing side or 
And what's, mm-hmm. you know, possibly, um, I mean, d- depending on how you look at it, not much better. Like the self-degradation of like, you're right, I am evil, I should be the loser. And it's yep. like... But don't you think even that self-degradation is just another effort at winning, right? Because you only self-degradate because you think that it gives it you power you virtuous. and value and virtue in some other play that yeah. you're doing. Which is why you never see this happen with like poor white people. You only see this happening with rich academic white people who have the – the for whom that self-degradation uh, – is actually making them appear more powerful to other white people and yeah, so yeah, get yeah. more benefits. I mean, there's literally terms for this. Like there's like a, a, a created words and terms for people who participate in that paradigm in the right. And it's right. I mean, my, my point is simply to say that it's like, it's still, it's still the same war of all against all. It's just, and, and it's just ridiculous that, I mean, if you read Foucault, it's like, yeah, obviously <laughs> like, to give an example, you can read De Tocqueville and see. I mean, you can just like thing. everybody yeah. knows that self degradation is a tactic in a game of power. Like, oh, yeah. and, and you know, when we saw the riots, um, when there were all those like police officers kneeling before like um, protesters, both sides, I th- like both sides were correct to to not take that seriously because it's like, yeah, you can say that they're being. They're degrading themselves or whatever, or like losing their dignity. But at the same time, this is obviously a way of diffusing yeah. the protest that's working. And so you had people on the far left saying, like, don't let them do this. You know what I'm saying? Because like, they understood it as a power struggle in a and way then, that and then like, it milked. created a fo- positive feedback loop because when they said, don't let them do this, that didn't even work. So then both sides were now like just angry at the yeah. impotence of the, of the gesture. Yeah. No, no, totally. It's like where there is no Christianity, you don't get to just you don't get to just achieve an equitable and just society like by by strong arming people into bowing. Because bowing itself is only ever going to occur when it's seen in the self interest of the of the individual who bows. I mean, you will never get someone doing it out of charity, which is the difference. Where there's no love, it's like, well, then the society is you, you just have different winners and losers, right? But you yeah. don't actually have common participation moving towards a common good. Anything like that is, is gone. Yeah. So it's frustrating because it's some of what critical race theory says, I think, is true. But since they don't actually question their yeah, metaphysical no assumptions, then <clears throat> when they get to it, it's like, yeah, I see absolutely no reason why white people shouldn't do exactly what you're doing for the sake of white people. Yeah. Given your presumptions, it's yeah. like there's no there's no unifying bond. So no. why don't you just win the war? It's mm-hmm. like yeah anyways that was an interruption and I no, that's actually that's really great and that explains a lot of why um because even if a lot of these guys don't believe in critical race theory or believe that it's happening um it's hard to deny that it is one of the ways in which our regime and our society operates and so they're in their mind and in my mind at the time it was a battlefield you were forced to fight on sure because it, you know, I, I started to believe like that there, what really mattered was practically, yes, I'm going to end up in this battle, whether I want to or not. So I should right. side with, I should side with the side that doesn't end up with me under, underfoot. Right. You yeah, see where yeah. the power struggles are and yeah. you have to engage those, yeah. those battles. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, integralists talk like this a lot of the time that, you know, if we have some critique of the state or bureaucracy, often the response is something like, um, well, but look at how powerful the state is. Look at how awful the bureaucracy is mm-hmm. being. You don't have a choice. You yeah. have to engage. You know, there's no sense of the church building up um, a new kingdom. It's always a um, a game in which you're forced to play in this kingdom, right, in, in the world. And so it's, it makes sense to me. And that's why I think there's so much power and like, like hurrah sort of feeling whenever someone allows you to not question deeper metaphysical assumptions and just say, hey, let's win. It's like, hey, yeah. race has become the battlefield. Let's win the race battlefield. Hey, Government is the battlefield. Let's win the government. You know what I mean? It's like in each right. case, it's just saying it's the simplest thing in the world. You don't have to convince anyone yeah. that given a fight, you should win the fight. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but it's it's almost in a way it's weaker. And this is why young men fall into this so easily because, I mean, it, 
you, you no longer have a society where it's like, let's go to war for our, you know, for king and country or whatever. And they actually go to a physical war, right? right. They're just told where the battle is in some like political way, especially in, you know, America and the West. And, and they, they don't question whether or not the battle is actually theirs. They're just told that it is, and they have enough perception th- to perceive it at a surface level as there. And so they decide to fight because it's just, I mean, it's just how young men think about the world. I mean, it's how a lot of the young men I interacted with thought about the world. So I, I knew part of the story, so I'm going I'm to push you on, on a, a side of it. You're in this world. Yeah. You're starting to become a bigger uh, online presence. Yeah. Uh, within it, you're you're not so much in like the popularity way, but just like uh, I had more influence over other people, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you were the the meta power here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. But one of the, one of the things that you guys saw kind of a hope in Trump's election. Yeah. Can you first tell us about like why that was? so so inspiring to you like what did you see in that i mean obviously he's saying make america great again he's you know bringing hope back to i mean our region in particular you know yeah uh, steubenville went red for the first time in 45 years or something like that 44 okay. years or something like that um so obviously there's the general focus on america but what, you know from your vantage what did you see personally i was all in and really in love with Trump because he was an establishment and he was an opportunity to use the power of the establishment against itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I was I was not bought into – I'd basically given up on the Republicans. I saw them as, frankly, in, in most ways, no better than the Democrats. Mm-hmm. Um, even the things that like, for example, in like my Catholic – you know, our, our Catholic beliefs – I, I just did not view them as even accomplishing those things. Like they said they would, and I viewed it as they said they would do it, and they did something like, like abortion. Like abortion, yeah. I, I, I was always, and I and still to some degree, am hard pressed to find something substantive. Until you know, within the last couple of months, it looks like maybe we'll have our first victory in <laughs> twenty years since I was born. Almost, I mean, um, but but. You know, I was hard pressed at the time to f- even find like a victory where they'd actually made a substantive gain on abortion. They just said like, "Oh, we're pro life. Vote for us because we're pro life." And it's like, "Well, what did you actually do that was pro life besides say it?" You mm-hmm. know. And so I, I, I really didn't like the establishment, the establishment Republicans, or or even the party. And and then here comes this guy running as a Republican who seems like he's outside the. <clears throat> establishment enough and he's also got enough support from the people that the establishment can't help is like forced to support him um and so at the time it was it was very much i loved i just i viewed him as not as a republican but just as donald trump just as a figure that was not within the political sphere and and i viewed that as the political sphere as the enemy as the problem so yeah, that was that was what it was. Is we just we just wanted somebody who wasn't, you know, a, a politician, for lack of a better term. Right. Well, and I mean, there's plenty to disagree with what I'm about to say, but he didn't really do that much more than the average Republican. No, once he was in office, he really didn't. Yeah. Um, but by t- by the time 2020 rolled around, it was more it was almost the exact same view, but a little bit better of just like. You know, the, the left had gotten so extreme by the time the 2020 election rolled around that it was almost just like Trump has to win or the or the world's going to go insane. You know, America's just going to go to, you know, hell in a handbasket. Mm-hmm. Um, As your mother would say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> As my mother would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, by the time 2020 rolled around, it was it was more about that. Um also, for a lot of guys, including me, it was our first time we ever got to vote in a, polit- in a presidential election. Mm. Um, and so he was our guy. Uh, it was just like a team thing. Like We're on that team. We want our team to win. I mean. I find this kind of strange because a lot of people look at Trump and say why they love him for all sorts of different reasons. None of them seem to be a perfect description of who he is or what he's done but yeah. it's just an emblematic aesthetic. He, a, it's a cult of personality yeah mm-hmm. um, but it's it, it's interesting to take it from the alt-right because i think 
well, as you're describing it, you you are kind of cutting. Th- there was a group that really was cutting through a lot of the rhetoric that that people had been, um, you know, spewing <laughs> yeah. for a number of years. It seemed like at one point that you know that knife kind of got dull cutting through. Some yeah, of that. yeah. You yeah. think that's fair or no? Trump's knife got dull. No, no, no. Like the the far right's knife got dull cutting through the rhetoric on another things. I mean, this is as you say, it was a cult I think of personality. He, he, to some degree, yes. I think it is mm-hmm. currently dull. Um, I will okay. say yeah. um, the m- branch of the far right that I was most involved with, America First, I have a lot of very fundamental problems with them at this point. Um, I'll say I've had some internet friends that I'd known for upwards of a year who we really don't get along with anymore because I don't... I, I really do have a problem with that. America First. I'll... I'll point out all day up and down the lack of actually efficacious accomplishments that they can point to as purely their own. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure they'll see this and they'll be mad. Um, That's fine. uh, No offense, but holding a conference is not an efficacious accomplishment. It's people who like what you have to say coming to hear you say it, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's one of the things they'll mainly point to. It's like, oh, we have our conference every year. It's like, oh, cool. People come to hear speeches. Like you're not... (laughs) Yeah, um, but I, I don't think. But they're they're all in on Trump again. Um, but okay, so you were all in on Trump. Yeah, you started. Yeah. So there was something I I remember um, in November, Fox, CNN, everybody was talking about how after the election, everybody's questioning the results. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. this true? And there's a an abnormally oh, yes. okay. large group of young men who started, who got the personal phone numbers of quite a number of state representatives in the quote unquote questionable states so, like of, of yeah. Georgia and Wisconsin. And that was you. <laughs> so it wasn't just me. I was a large part of it. Um, I will say we did not intend to get the personal phone numbers for YouTube's sake. I did not intend to dox them. It was their fault, and I will explain how. Um, So I have some online friends, um, and starting on election night at about 4 a.m., we started to see what – I have to be very careful here so that (laughs) none of the censors get mad at us suggesting something fishy happened. No, but there the was a huge fair... upsurge yeah, in, in Biden votes. Yes, they're, yeah. they're, you know, it was yeah. the freest and fairest election of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, so on election night, um, I think it was around when the um, everybody's seen the graph with the weird blue line that goes straight up all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, I think it was around when that happened, if I remember right. Me... Uh, the guy who was really leading the group at that time, I won't say his name, I won't even say his internet handle because <laughs> I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to um, mess him up. Mess it. I don't want to make it, give out anybody. Him and four or five, I guess, other guys who were in um, this online community that I was a part of, um, we got together and we decided that we were, we were the guys who were you know, had a, a significant amount of power over, it was a discord server with about 1500 other young guys who were all into, you know, right-wing politics. So we decided to try to organize basically a grassroots phone bank, for lack of a better term, to call state representatives in the states where things that we thought were fishy was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those were Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Arizona, as far as I remember. We may have done Nevada at a later time, but I think it was those five to start with. Um, And so we took the publicly available information of public office phones and we organized it all into a series of spreadsheets and we sent them out so people could, and told people, you know, you should call these people, you should tell them to look into the election, to look into possibilities possibilities of fraud in different states, in these states, in your state. Um, um, sadly, and this is a sad thing, most state representatives don't think they're important enough that a lot of people will call that number or even look for it. Um, so I remember it, I, I got, I personally got one, um, in, in a couple of the states and, you know, I think in each state, it was at least five of the representatives had forwarded their office phones to their personal cell phones. Um, 
And so this was, you know, the night of, the night after, and then the next night mainly um, before the whole thing started. We had to, we decided to reel it back in because we didn't, we were getting attention we didn't want. <laughs> um, we were just calling people. And at a certain point, um, well, I won't say the name, a really popular <coughs> YouTube political commentator who, um, I'm not saying names before anybody <laughs> in the comment thinks he's not saying names to take the credit. No, I'm not saying names because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Yeah. Um, a, a really popular YouTube internet commentator who we were all part of this. That was the community we're doing. It, it was his online discord community, uh, tweeted the spreadsheets. Um, those representatives whose personal cell phone numbers were being rang through their office phones reported to Twitter that he had doxed them and he was banned from Twitter. Um, the next day, I believe the New York times, um, mentioned the campaign, what, what, what was happening. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things that like looking back on it, maybe wasn't, I don't know how efficacious it was, or even if I believed it would be totally efficacious at the time, but it was something where we had, we felt like we had to do something and this was the best thing we could come up with to do. <laughs> so, but you were, so just all to say, like you were in it and, and you saw oh, yeah. that you're, and I guess this is kind of where, where some of the turns started. I mean, you, um, at that time, like you really believed that something fraudulent had happened. Oh, I believed yeah. it a hundred percent at the time. Yeah. I, I, it, it, there was not a doubt in my mind. Yeah. Um, and then, and there's a c number of other things that are happening alongside that are, were were huge events for um, for the far right. I mean, I mean this the, is right after summer 2020. Yeah, exactly. You have the huge riots that are that are happening, yeah. um, and you have the um, the Kyle Rittenhouse incident. The what? Sorry, the incident happened in summer of 2020. The the, the, the actual shooting happened in summer of right. 2020. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and then you're kind of coming up on it, what seems to be a, a huge. Uh, a huge case from from again from your vantage like how much is in terms of the Rittenhouse trial Rittenhouse happened in 2021 so that was a year later uh the shooting occurred yeah, in 2020 yeah, yeah, yeah. right yeah. yeah so then so this is all kind of going through your mind I think it's passing through in large sweeps through through the movement yeah of of trying to build the narrative that you know there has to be something I institutionally think, done yeah. top down yeah yeah um I don't want to pretend to be like the expert on liberalism or post-liberalism, but given the things I believed and a lot of these guys believed, um, because we were within a liberal dichotomy and had no, didn't know any better that you could be outside of it. Mm -hmm. Um, this top down big government, big right wing government. Um, I mean, uh, there's a significant portion of it, including myself that, um, we're in favor of, of some type of like almost integralist fascism, right? Like Catholic theocratic fascism. Mm -hmm. um, um, we just didn't see another solution. Um, and we were so worried about what the left would do if they won the presidency that we didn't think that we would ever have any chance of gaining any power at the federal level again, if the left won. Um, and we believed we had won. We believed we had played the game fair. We had played the game fair and won and they had cheated. Mm. And, and that was incredibly angering for this group of guys. Right. So, if, you know, just kind of so far as you're describing it to me, I mean, it really seems like the, the far right, under, you know, has some of the same motivations. Let's go to the voting box, like the booth, you know, let's, let's get our candidate in and everything. Before 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they've changed at this point, but, um, but with kind of the more postmodern understanding that power relations are, are much more far reaching, uh, and yet without any of the Christian solutions of how to be able to operate within them. So, you know, where that you just use fascist, you know, is, is a big one gets thrown around quite carelessly today. Um, but if you're able to, I mean, at one point, would you have said, you know, like the, the, the Nazi 
I mean, there are kind of a rise of these guys online who are like Nazis and, and self-proclaimed yeah. fascists. Like they actually made a presence in this group and like, and they saw that the only way of, I knew of, a couple. Yeah. Yeah. Of like actually getting through to the, or breaking through the power dynamics was actually an integration of all top down structure. So integrating the economy with, with the state, for instance. Yeah. I, I knew more than a, f I knew, I knew, I think probably seven or so. Um, I was, to be totally honest, I was right of the average, even in this group, mm. but I wasn't as far as you could get. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think there were some of the groups that I was involved in that I was the furthest right of them. Mm -hmm. um, but that was more me attempting to show these more like these m more like less far right movements, the logical conclusions of some of their beliefs and trying to get them to, to move it, move, move, come on, move along. Like, you know, this clearly isn't working what you're trying, you know, When's the last time your elected official actually got something done? This kind of stuff, you mm -hmm. know. And so there were there were groups I was involved in that I was the furthest right. Um, the the main one I was involved in, I don't think I was the furthest right. Um, I think by the, the end, because most of the guys who were further right of me had been you know left or been asked to leave, I was the furthest right by the end of it. So like, what's the first, like? How do you how do you measure that in certain ways? It's like who reads Mein Kampf the most in a year, or something like that. <laughs> I mean, there's no quantitative way. It's just whoever's like got the most extreme solution, basically. <laughs> right. Whoever's solution is the most extreme is the guy who's furthest right. Um, uh, so, what what ultimately got you out of it? So we kind of got you. You're in. You're in. You have so, this. Um, I, I guess. So when I started getting into it, I had been different people have different perspectives on the situation that happened in my life personally, but I'd been through, through one circumstance or another, I left a Catholic, my, my, the Catholic community I was most involved with the Catholic community I was most involved with. And si simultaneous with that, um, that was late 2019, the stuff with the Gorp war, the Charlie Kirk stuff started to happen. Um, and then, um, just a few months later, I was, my job moved to an area where it, I, I was, um, I, I, I mean, it sounds cliche, but I just didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. I was raised in a farm town in middle Indiana and I moved to a, uh, I, I worked for Kroger. I moved to a Kroger in a, in a poor urban area. Um, and so I was seeing a lot of stuff that really upset me then, and then it confirmed certain things I was coming to believe or pushed those things into my mind more and more. Mm. Um, so at a certain point I moved job I, my the store I worked at was moved again it was to a upper middle class uh upper middle class suburb um simultaneous with that I was starting to um I was starting to get back into rock climbing I really enjoyed rock climbing I still really do I haven't been able to do it as much since I moved to Steubenville but um I was starting to take better care of myself physically eating better um, I have Crohn's disease, so I have to be careful with what I eat. I was not super great about what I ate for a couple of years, but I started to eat really well. Um, I started to maintain and put on weight. And, um, I mean, it sounds, it sounds dumb, but it, it is really good when you, um, look in the mirror <laughs> and you go from like being like the scrawny kid that <laughs> looks super weak to like, holy cow, look at that. Like I did that. <laughs> it feels good. Um, my emotional state got better. Um, and then I, I simultaneously had started, I had found, um, new polity through pints with Aquinas. Um, and I started to look into it and I kind of came to a realization. The dark allure of the good Catholic boys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I came to this realization without realizing this it in this, these terms that I'd been operating I'd been looking for a solution in a system that where the solution was not. Um, and that had started to affect the method by which I thought I could get to that solution. You know, if the solution was my team should win and I viewed my team as white people, you know, mm -hmm. well, where's the solution on this? What's well, this one? Oh, that means I also should believe this. And it creates a positive feedback loop where you move further and further. Right. Um, 
all tautological, ideological. In that point, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I, I began to but based in kind of real injustices that you're seeing. Yeah, you're I, mean, was, was, that, I mean, it was it was it was. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about like the summer of 2020, the fact that, or even you want to go all the way to November 2021 when the actual Rittenhouse trial was, mm -hmm. the fact that that I mean, in my opinion, still. The fact that that young man even had to go to trial when everything he did was on video mm. and there were multiple witnesses who saw and heard what he claimed he saw and heard. I mean, I think anybody who has some self-preservation instinct would have acted very similarly to him. Um, and and him getting off was, was like a great, was one of the biggest things that helped me get out of like a, a negative mental state about these things because it meant that there was still justice but the fact that he had to go to trial at the time and that year of that stuff and and um the way the january 6 protesters were treated um whether what they did was you know i mean storming the capitol and the violence or whatever it's not great but the way they were treated especially because the majority of them that were arrested were arrested on literally just trespassing and you know held without bail and solitary confinement for some of them for months on end and it's like you started to feel like the people the the rulership that you had an instinctive belief should be caring for you and for the people that under them was actually just trying to destroy you wanted you gone didn't want you around um and that that drives you into not a great emotional place um Especially since all of this is kind of being experienced online and online without any, without any reality to check you. Yeah, and and, and <coughs> I mean it's unfortunate. Um, but like if I if something similar to that were to happen today in the world, right? In Steubenville, I could be like, "Hey, this is." I could say to somebody like one of my friends in Steubenville that I know in real life, I see daily. Like this is really frustrating. This is wrong, right? And they'd be like, "Yeah, that's frustrating," but. And they, you know, reel you back in. But in the situation a lot of these guys are in and I was in, nobody would even say, yes, that's frustrating. And we understand why you're mad until they would say, and we're mad about it too. <laughs> and so it created this, for lack of a better word, it did create an echo chamber. Um, because nobody in your real, in my real life was saying, you're right. This should, this it's, it's okay for you to be mad about this. It's okay for you to be worried about this until they were saying there was somebody online who, I mean, was saying, you're right. I understand why you're mad and we're mad too. And we're worried too. And, and so there's not people to talk to these young men and tell them, I mean, it's really sad still. I mean, I still talk to a lot of these guys. I know a lot of these guys. I mean, these were some of my closest friends for upwards of a year. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still really close with several of them. I mean, I'm going to one of their weddings in November. He invited mm -hmm. me to his wedding. Mm -hmm. um, so you, 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 um, you get into this, you find there's, there's things that you're upset about. The only people that give you ear for that are other guys online. Don't have kind of a dynamic understanding of reality. Um, the, uh, you, a number of positive things start to happen yeah in your in your life that makes you i guess um look around for, for I, I looked up from the screen for lack of a better way of saying okay. it i looked up oh. and i was willing to, i wasn't hiding in this fake reality on the internet anymore i started to want to experience real life because my real life felt like it was worth experiencing and good to experience for the first time mm. in a long time hmm. that's awesome yeah, yeah. And then actually, so so there's a number of these issues that you've mis mentioned to us. It's just funny, though. I, I was thinking that you have this weird, maybe this is just the description of any empire on its way to destruction, right? But you have, like, the people who create the internet as these, like, like obviously left-leaning corporations that abhor people like you providing the space <laughs> thanks mark yeah 
I abhor you, but just on a per- <laughs> yeah. personal. Basis. That's actually better than just. Yeah. You know, it's, it's hatred, right? Hatred sees the person and yeah. hates him. I appreciate that you see me. I see you. I appreciate being seen and known. See you. I know you. And I hate you. <laughs> right? Those guys hate you, but they don't see you right now. So it's not as it's not as robust. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I would just marvel some sometimes at just like. One of the nice things about looking up from your screen is that you can actually look at the internet as a specific mode of production that profits people that you, you're not necessarily look, like involved in while you're seeing this. You can just see like, okay, here's a group of people who provide the means for echo chambers that obviously produce um, in, in a – obviously produce extremes – so they they're profiting from it quite literally and denying it on a superficial level, and then you have like this alarmed liberal class in the middle saying that the people who run these machines should basically make them more effective in order to target the very people who they're profiting from, and so you end up with this like constant loop in society where it's like, is there anything more obvious to say than that media and internet companies profit from pushing people to extremes no it's it's, it's very obvious it's, yeah <laughs> and, and and it's like to me what's very liberating about a kind of ludditeism as as part of the catholic tradition which i think it really is is that when you look up from the screen it's not just like a lifestyle choice like now nah, i'm gonna grow carrots although you should um it's like allowing you the breath and the space you need to judge the system as a whole which is like oh like in my very extremity, I'm profiting the people I hate, right? And in my in in their very greed, they require people like me who care about things and are willing to form intense communities um, online in the very alienated, isolated world that they continuously create. And they also profit from convincing you you can't say these things in the real world, right? Because then you have to say it there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. It's like it, it's not connection. it's yeah. not just like the destruction of community, um, which is obviously what people like, you know, Zuckerberg are engaged in, right? Quite proudly. Like we are making a world in which location doesn't matter. This is what they say. Um it's like they rely on I mean their money comes to the degree that people are disembodied, alienated, isolated, and unable to attain goods except for through their services. So they rely on this creation of a consumer renting society to a greater and greater degree. That's what's happened. Um, but what what those people actually look like, what isolated, alienated, atomized people who can only unify together through ideas is the very extremism that they're like, you know, ostensibly opposed to. Because when you don't have community, what unites you to a person can't be a real good that we're involved in, can't be something we're participating in. It has to be – like, or at least it's much more likely that it's something we both hate. Yeah. Because hatred has the same kind of unifying – or it feels like it's the same kind of unifying reality as the common good. Whereas the common good is like, hey, man, I live next to you and we're involved in each other's life whether we like it or not and I'm – stealing your coffee and all that like that becomes <laughs> uh it, it doesn't need hatred for us to be united yeah. because we're united on the basis of pursuing goods together and trying to help each other flourish but when you take all that away and i don't see you i don't know you i don't share in your life i don't participate in it my hmm. actions like in the physical world do not affect you then you need a replacement for unity and it just seems like hatred does the trick because it says, oh, yeah, we, you and I, we're involved with each other's life because screw that guy. <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, the, exactly what like Hobbes and then Gerard says is the origin of human society. Is that conflict? Is it coming together to beat some other guy? Yeah. Um, it's just that the internet makes it true. It's like you can or, – or it pushes us towards making it true. Um, so I, I don't think looking up is just this. I mean, sometimes you hear this described that it's like, well, these are just online people as if that doesn't matter. It's like, no, no, no. Online is the solution to a destroyed world, right? 
they're not just the online people who are like, I mean, this is like the boomer critique of all this extremism. Like they're on their phones all the time. They're in all these chat rooms and they don't, it's like, no, no, no. They're there because you destroyed the world. Yeah. Are you going to let, are you going to talk to him and try to talk him out of it? Right. You're not even going to let him talk, talk about it or even consider their concern. Right. Right. Exactly. Then, then yeah, they're going to end up there where people will let them talk about their concerns. Totally. If you want people out of this, you have to be willing to talk to them about it without anger, with genuine concern and genuine love and hope that they will come to Christ. Got to mm. bomb the servers, you know? <laughs> I want to know where they are. Yeah. <laughs> Disavow. You know, you know how on Twitter people say that a, a retweet doesn't necessarily mean endorsement? Yeah. Well, it's for me, it's more Retweets like, don't equal endorsements. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's more like words that come out of my mouth don't equal endorsements. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I say it. <laughs> I, no, teach I, it, I teach anybody. you an onlineism. You say whatever you want so long as you follow it with in Minecraft. Because then it's a, it's a statement oh, sure. about what you're going to do in a video game. And it's Didn't, not an um, actual threat. Interesting. Wow. Wasn't this? I got to figure out what Minecraft is, and then I'll start <laughs> to say right. that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I feel like I'm just here to get us off topic. I apologize. No, that was awesome. That's I'm, really great because it really yeah. does ex- describe the dynamic that's happening with why guys end up where they are. Yeah. I, it's like I, if I, could, I was if I didn't have a community, aside from suicide, I would certainly be online. And certainly be trying to unite to my fellow man on the basis of hatred because online it seems much more efficacious than being like, hey, do you like – because because this is the thing. People want to be able to unite online by their common loves. But think about that. What's your common love? It has to have its ground in the real world. right? Yeah. So that means that, yeah, you can have this online community precisely because it's a reflection of a real community that you don't – like if you want me to get together with a bunch of guys only on a positive and charitable basis where we're mutually building each other up in virtue online – then we have to be talking about the fact that we all like woodworking or like that we're all raising pigs or that we're all doing something in reality. And that's why video games are so prevalent in these communities. That's a really good point. They actually Especially provide Especially like the... online video games that you play together. Talk like about Minecrafts. That. And I'm, I mean, one of the biggest turning... Minecraft? My... Minecraft. Do you actually not know? I will tell you. Do you actually not know or do you... are you just joking? I, is... So you know what a mine is? Like you bury it under the ground. Yeah, yeah, And it blows up. So Minecraft is an instructional... For people that don't necessarily have no. the skills to make mines. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, so it comes with I mine. to that. That every, sounds great. Everything you, you, know you mine just sweeper. said is wrong. <laughs> so every Windows computer comes loaded with Minesweeper and Minecraft. <laughs> is it like a, a manual? Minesweeper. Yeah. Minecraft. Minecomp. Three... <laughs> interrelated <laughs> amazing everything right. you just said is wrong <laughs> i do try all right so uh, explain mine it's I, like a minecraft is like a, it's a sandbox game it's that, it's procedurally generated which means every world is randomized every time you load a new world it's randomized totally okay um and you i'm you, clear on that now <laughs> Pro- right, procedural move on. Everybody procedural, else knows. you run around you build stuff okay nope. cool yeah basically right? you, you <laughs> dig stuff out of the ground you build stuff it's sandbox which means you can do anything you can think of basically Sweet. within the mechanics of the game okay but it also lets you play online all right so you can put all your friends in so it. you really can be gods together yeah yeah okay we well, put that's... all your friends in it you have a good time you know? okay well that's anyways it isn't a good but, my point was yeah. not just to talk about minecraft yeah. though but to say that there's something very natural about generating a, a, a thicker appearance of a of a real common like we share this together and then having the ideological unity which is a, a over hatred kind of come front like it gives that it gives that a positive content yeah right yeah. like normally it seems to me the normal political use of hatred in a world without the internet is that you have a good together with people and then when you find that under attack or at least you believe so then in that unity you guys get together at the bar and you say, boy, I hate this guy attacking our good, at the right? Box. Let's go kill him or whatever, right? Yeah. Tar and feather him per se. Big bird costume. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it seems like you, you have this really – in some ways it's, it's almost quaint in how obvious it is. You have this like, okay, take away reality, take away community, make everyone alone, um, enforce them being alone as much as you can. And then what do they do? Well, on the one hand, they build a world in which they have a common good, even if that common good is precisely invented. Like, what's your common good? We're all building a, I don't know how Minecraft works. We're building something together in Minecraft. Or we're, I don't, I'm not even going to try. But the point is, or we're, we're killing people on this uh, war game or whatever it is. 
I really That's don't a good know time I'm trying. It's okay. <laughs> and then that sort of provides a sense of the common good, which then makes the the political hatred, that is to say, um, it, it gives it a, a sort of artificial good. Yeah. That bonds you, and then the hatred becomes more I think there palatable. I think are good mm-hmm. uses of this because during like the pandemic, for example, when you couldn't go out and do things, I, I did have a couple real life friends, and you know it was we couldn't do anything, but we still wanted to hang out together mm-hmm. at least once a week, like we had been. Yeah. So we started playing video games together. Mm-hmm. You know, we made time one night a week to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think there are good places for it. I don't want to go as far as to say like video games and like the internet well, no, 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 have the, no place. But no, I'm not saying the, you're the saying liberal, that. I'm just no, saying. No, no, no. Because the liberal nation state is fundamentally like a remedial thing gone absolute. What I mean yeah, is like this is something we bring up all the time. It's like, look, an army is awesome when you need an army. Yeah. But having an army when you don't need an army – just hanging around it's kind means of... you're just gearing up for war. And literally anyone in the actual standing army admits this. It's like, well, <sighs> looks like we should have a war because we've been training for it for 20 years with these guys who – you know what I mean? Like we, the very presence of a standing army pushes us to war. Yeah. And so the remedial – thing that should be remedial, namely the army, becomes the absolute thing, namely the standing army. And this becomes the very structure of society. It's the same thing with like in bureaucracy. It's the same thing with like uh, – I don't know. Like the fact that we can ship food from California to us and eat it is not in itself bad. There's no technology here that's in itself bad. It's like, yeah, I can imagine the remedial situation, which I'd be very grateful yeah. for that. But the question is, why is that what we do? And the All only the way we do yeah. it. Yeah. And in a similar sense, it's like, yeah, with the games, it's like they're not bad insofar as they're meeting uh, something that's been taken away. The question is, why has it become the norm or certainly did become the norm that a youth, like what – the content of youth is spent playing games. Yeah. Why has the remedial become the absolute? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, when, when my time went from playing video games to going to a climbing gym, and I mean, I didn't agree with most of the guys. Like, climbing is very, very left liberal. Is it? <laughs> it's, I mean... I, well, it has that I kind of image where you're more going marijuana than sort of, you would believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's sort of like it's the image of progress, right? Like I, I don't know, going up. It's the hippie outdoorsy thing, I think. Okay. Yeah. Imagine the outdoors. Um, but I, I didn't agree with most of these people politically. Uh, we had very different lifestyles. I'll say that. Um, <laughs> but I had real people I was interacting with multiple times a week, and they were the same people. Mm. But people don't. People and I don't, had a community totally. of the climbing gym. But people, so people just, don't understand where tolerance comes from, because like on the right, they hate it because precisely because it's preached as this like give up on anything that matters to you and submit, loser. Like that's what tolerance yeah, is. Yeah, right? yeah. But when you actually have a community, you realize that tolerance is on the basis of shared goods. It's like I don't, I don't tolerate like what's wrong or sinful about the person i'm at the climbing gym with i tolerate him precisely insofar as we're involved in a good that we're both participating in that doesn't involve what's wrong and sinful about the reasons he's doing it i'm not going to participate in your conversations about your latest you know sexual conquest but hey bro how'd you do that route because i'm working on it and this is the polar opposite of liberalism people whenever i say this they think like i'm being liberal like well we just have to accept our differences because we're all involved with each other it's like no no no. imagine the world imagine the the it's like you have – I got to do something with this cup. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You've got the idea of the church, which is precisely the idea that we are most united in common good because we're finally all actually after the same goal, salvation in Christ. And you can imagine the greater degree of tolerance because – we're precisely more unified. So that in that little way where you can tolerate people because you're participating in the same good of the climbing gym, conversion to Catholicism means a deeper and deeper ability to tolerate difference and even to celebrate it in the way that like liberals want to say we're doing now, which is obviously not the case. Um, <sighs> precisely because you have more and more agreement on what matters. What matters. And so to advocate tolerance from the Catholic tradition, is it's understood that you are more and more able to tolerate precisely in that you're more and more able to you're, – you're more and more in love with the same objects basically. You're more and more pursuing God together. And what toleration means now in this city of man and, and is that you find 
precisely those places in which you're both pursuing God, even if it's under the guise of a small good, like the climbing gym. And in that shared participatory space, you're able to tolerate each other. And like, people just know this, like you don't, like when you are at a party with lots of people who think lot, lots of different things, you don't like get sullen and go into a corner because that guy <laughs> thinks something that's wrong. Even if in so far as he thinks it's wrong, like you don't tolerate that. You can have those things together. Like I do not tolerate you in your error. I do not tolerate you in your sin. And yet yeah. I do tolerate you insofar as we belong together in the church. But, but that necessarily implies that you have to have a proper vantage, like a proper vision of reality to be able to tell at what point a good is being really lost. Sure. You know, in more ultimate sense. And the rock climbing thing for the, you know, at a party, you can kind of, you know, oh, work I should throw that out there because it was my, yeah. it was a participation in a real life. No, but I, think, I don't, I don't yeah, try yeah. to make it trivial. Yeah, yeah. I'm just say, saying that it, um, you know, the predicaments don't, it seemed to be as um, acute. Maybe mm -hmm. my point is that Catholics climb the rock that is Christ, and so what you <laughs> <laughs> thought Peter was the rock. There's a lot of rocks, actually. It turns out, <laughs> just a lot of them. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Did you know the Israelites thought pretty consistently, and it does seem that Paul thought this that the rock that Moses struck to get water followed the Israelites around. Okay. Yeah, just the rock went with them, like a puppy. I like puppies. Sweet. Wherever they and are. they also thought that this was by virtue of of Miriam, like in the merit of the sister of Moses, they were followed around by a rock that gave them water. It's things that we don't talk about and that we shouldn't talk about right now. <laughs> <laughs> One day we're going to have to do an episode on a humanity's obsession with worshiping rocks. Really into this. I think it's really all idols are made of some kind of rock. It's kind of weird. Kind of, yeah. Well, anyways, <laughs> anyway, um, um, just say I'm, I'm grateful. I think, you know, there's a, this is just a, a very, I think we're slowly starting to get to an answer here of, of why we're seeing a number of guys be diffused in a sense. Yeah. And it's, and it's precise. Well, I think what Jacob's referring to is like, as far as it, we're concerned, a lot of Nazis are converted into Catholicism. That's exactly it. Yeah. Like, I'm, like, literally, I'm not, like, just being... You know, you have a, not, a lot of... I do think that you have a lot of Nazis that are converting to Catholicism and staying Nazis. Yeah, that gets I'm, weird. You know. It is but odd. is it weirder than, like, the <clears throat> fact that right now in, in liberal paradise, like, a bunch of Masons convert to Catholicism and no one points out the difference between... Well, that that is weird, too. But I do... <laughs> what I would just say in terms of, like, the Nazis converting, it's because they need some... They still realize that there needs to be some sort of moral power that is absolute and that paganism is, is facially ridiculous yeah it's facially yeah and christianity has rendered it such and so when they are trying to say america first all this stuff there's they're searching out of some sort of real cohesion uh, or searching for some real cohesion and with the with the moral backbone to give clarity to the uh you know the fight that they're now engaged in and so I mean, that's a huge problem. But it, for those who actually are, you know, um, taking the, the faith seriously, considering its totalizing effect, I think there's, and also just recognize, I think actually it all coming down to a, a real face-to-face -face encounter with him who is love, then that begins to diffuse the, any attempt to, co to coerce into the right behavior as an absolute end. Um, and, uh, and I think, I think we're seeing some guys just come in contact yeah. with love. I, I just also would love to make an appeal to anybody watching, not necessarily who's like participating in these politics, mm. but has a friend or thinks they know a family member who maybe, um, a lot of their concerns are legitimate. Mm. And if you would just listen to them and be willing to discuss with them, that will soften them significantly because the reason they end up further and further right, the places that these people who, who might be worried about, it's because no one will talk to them hmm. because they're alone in the real world. So they find friends online and they're aware of that too. The, the guys that end up online doing this, they're, they are self-aware of that. Sure. that it, I mean, you, it is a prevalent this sounds ridiculous, but this is how ideas are communicated online. It's a prevalent meme hmm. of, of the angry, the lonely young man who finds the only people who will listen or talk to him in these right-wing movements. Hmm. Yeah, yeah.
So just like, just, just, yeah, I, I really think people should, I, I wouldn't even say do it by force. Like don't, if you're a parent, don't be like angry about it. Just really listen to them because if they're participating in this, then they've probably been thinking about it for a while and are probably legitimately worried and angry about something hmm. that they view as, as a threat to their future and, and their future children's future. Um, how, how are you, you use the term softening, which seems to be like almost a prerequisite for conversion, I would hope. Is that what you experienced was like a softening into, because I don't think we've actually really discussed like oh. you, you, your own conversion, what you're describing as a conversion here. Yeah, I, I found... I mean, it, the, uh, it, being able to rock climb and having, even though it was in a Catholic community, um, being able to, um, I, had a, I had a job that I was not, you know, I had a job I was proud to say I was had for the first time in a while. Looking back on it, it was kind of a stupid job, but but I'd worked hard to get to where I, I was at the time. Um, yeah, it wasn't so much somebody who pulled me out of it, it was it was finally being in a state. The but, perfect storm coincided to pull me in, and I, I was blessed enough that the Lord sent a perfect storm to pull me back out. Right, right. Um, and then I moved to Steubenville December 31st. <laughs> yeah, I got um, that. I got that. Was it text message or a call? I forget. Text. Yeah. At like 4 a.m. on December 31st. Yeah. <laughs> And then you came up to our New Year's Eve party. Yeah. It was awesome. Like, That's where we first met. Yeah. Um, but what do you think? Because obviously, like, you can't just go from, okay, I have these beliefs to I've experienced community and now the beliefs are falsified, as it were. Like, I, what I'm saying is, what did you believe in and what convinced me otherwise? Yeah. Like, what was the, because there has to be, why I mean, aren't you a racist like, anymore, has, Josiah? <laughs> yeah. It has to be like theoretical <laughs> content, right? Because it's, we're, we're not, because sometimes, sometimes we'll talk this way about student, but I think it can be kind of damaging to to the cause here. Because it's like, oh, just just like plug into a community, and then all of your bad ideas will be falsified, which is obviously not the case. Like there has to be a, a feedback between community. There, and there the has to be some interaction with the community beliefs, that does it. Yeah. The community itself is not what does it. Yeah, it wasn't efficacious anymore. I I, I didn't need to think about these things constantly to participate in my primary community. I see. Hmm. That's a good argument, actually. And that gave you yeah. just like the distance to then evaluate the beliefs, or to, did the, the beliefs distance actually... to the distance to evaluate the beliefs, um, discard what was false, mm -hmm. retain what was true, mm -hmm. and and then test it slowly into a more coherent worldview. Totally, man. And then you know, over time, is I'm not like I used to think of myself as some some deep thinker but i'm not um and because i'm not i just test i still am going through this process of testing things does it work no it doesn't work okay we'll get rid of it well this one fits so i'll, I'll keep this one you know mm -hmm. yeah what, what you're describing is really interesting because it shows how an idea can be necessary to like you even if it's a bad idea like it is necessary in order to justify um, a bad world that I hang on to these ideas. It's better to live in a community. bad world than to not live in a world at all. Right, right, exactly. Mm. It's better to have an identity than to be completely, um, you know, just atomized and in the void, contrary to what people will say. And to my mind, this is actually just a part of the Christian understanding. It's just being kind of given new terms, which is that sin is not just like you doing bad things. It's you seeking security in those bad things. And so part of the difficulty of conversion of leaving sin behind is that those sins have to become no longer necessary to you. Like if you think about something very different than what we we're discussing, like greed, it's false just to say that sin of greed is just this, like, um, I don't know, this lust for money that kind of has no, it's sui generis. It's just there. It's like, obviously it's the need for security that creates the sin which looks at money and says, you will provide that existential security for me. And so conversion from greed, from sin, 
has to be finding that provision of security in the real, like, oh, I'm actually abundantly provided for. Now, it's not that I like just grit my teeth and get rid of greed. It's like I allow myself to not need greed anymore, not need money um, or not in the way that I think I need it. And I think it's similar with every sin. I mean, this is why you can really approach people no matter what their sin is therapeutically. I don't mean this like in a hippie sense. I just mean that like if I'm talking to someone who's struggling with lust, if I'm talking to someone who's struggling with alcoholism, there are often very similar things where like just saying like, isn't this thing you believe bad? Isn't this thing that you think about yourself bad? That's not really what helps. What helps is to point to the reasons why they don't need what this sin is proclaiming um, to fulfill. Like, yeah, like God loves you. We're here for you. You know, like actually being here for you. The occasion of this setting. Yes. You know, enables this, yeah, this change of, of belief to the, the actually the true replacement for the idol. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it, it just seems like the, the, I mean, liberals generally are just insane about this because they have no concept of sin or at least they're trying not, well, they do, but they have a bad concept of sin. <laughs> And so what they want to do is just centrally manage the world into right belief. And what they don't see is how wrong belief in a bad world is like a life raft sometimes. And so they just want to be like, how do we correct these people? It's like, you need a different world. And the problem is you're not willing to give up the world you've created. So, yeah, yeah, that's somehow both pessimistic and optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're glad you're here. Any last I'm glad words? to be here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think you gave a great little shout out to the um, to those who uh, to know those on the far right who are kind of like drowning in well loneliness, I guess, more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would you last kind of charge to those who are to the drowning? Actual guys, yeah, in loneliness. This is going to sound super cliche, um, but if you're a guy, I'd I'd really recommend. Well, I'm, I don't know what to recommend to the women. If you're a woman, I'm sorry, I don't know what to recommend to you. <laughs> He's not, um, he hasn't met you yet. <laughs> I haven't met you yet. Um, That's all. If you're a woman, never mind. Um, <laughs> if you're a guy, yeah, I, I yeah, give me a call. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Discord at Thursday. Um, <laughs> Don't do that. That's don't weird. do that. Yeah. That's weird. We'll, we'll, um, we'll dox you on Twitter. Yeah. Put your phone number up in a spreadsheet. Yeah. Dude, that <laughs> women, for, for, yeah. I'll just do the do the office one. I'll forward it to myself. Uh, if you're a guy, try to find a, a legitimate masculine community, even if it's something that like politically you don't associate with a lot of the members of the community, like a gym. Even if it's not. I mean, rock climbing was it for me? I had a history of rock climbing before I did that. Before I went back to the gym, um, weightlifting, running. Um, get involved with your church's men's group. Um, I'd also recommend if you fancy yourself, um, <clears throat> your beliefs to be based in some type of intellectual sphere, I'd recommend reading, um, the article on New Polity's website, uh, by Schindler, uh, what is liberalism? Um, and I'd recommend listening to a really old episode of the podcast called why nationalism isn't Catholic. Um, so you can actually try to understand, uh, what it is nationalism is and what it is we mean by when we say liberalism because we don't just mean the global libtard menace or whatever so yeah we were talking earlier it's like some of the things that the nationalists say now self-proclaimed nationalists say now just seem to be truths of common sense that are being taken as I yeah ideology. given a nation state the one i'm a part of should i should treat i should like the most and it's like okay. yeah totally it's like in the same way <laughs> in the same way that the like, argument isn't given yeah, that's not the argument. The argument is, should we say, given the nation state? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like <laughs> yeah. a father should definitely provide for his son before he provides for the needy member of another family. Yeah. That's obvious. Yeah. So what we're talking about is an order of charity that um, is real. And if all you're saying when you say nationalism is that in a similar sense, the nation should first care for its people before, I don't know, sending however much military aid we send to Ukraine. Or $80 billion. Like that. Dollars. Oh, it's a lot of money. Um, and to I that... I should become Ukrainian. <laughs> like that, that is not the problem. Um, it's that... It, what I mean to say is that is not the content of nationalism. The question is like, 
what is the liberal modern nation state that has been invented in the last 300 years? And is it the way to organize society such that we produce virtuous people? Yep. That is the critique that the church has of nationalism. It is not a critique of the order of charity, which is just obvious. I've come to say recently that nationalism is bad because it doesn't go far enough. <laughs> right. You know, Your really base cool. is the nation. It's like, no, 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 no. Bring it down a little. Like, <laughs> and precisely when you do that, you can actually think beyond the nation too. It's like, you know, because people don't understand this about the church because they hear the Pope's advocating for like world government and all they can think of is the liberal paradigm in which this just means like the UN or like some, something that yeah. is basically like supranational, um, which just becomes a big nation. Like, in their minds, it's the same yeah. thing. It's just a nation that's now over you. And why would you do that? You get the Star Trek Federation. Yeah. <laughs> but like the idea is precisely that wherever there is real power over others, it needs to be for their sake. Like we need to turn power away from this kind of amassment of securities for the sake of individuals and into a gift for others. It's for the weak. The father-son paradigm is a paradigm for all government, namely that you use your higher power precisely to raise up what is below you. And that this doesn't have any theoretical stopping point um, wherever there is that power. I mean, the popes are literally saying, oh, obviously we have global power. Better use that global power for the weak. And, and nationalists don't understand this paradigm because they always think of it as establishing a power. Like, let's give some people some power to kick the nation's butt. It's like, no, they are honestly seeing that the world is run globally. Currently. Right now. Is like you think nations are so important? <laughs> like, can we talk about the corporations that and, and actually run our nations? Know this. Like they literally have terms for this. They call it the global the current global term, elite, right? Globalist or, global American Empire. Right. Which is a hilarious acronym because of how it's pronounced. Right. No, I know. But you think about it. <laughs> you think about it, it's like <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just did it in my head. You did think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was done that way on purpose. Like, yeah. That's what they call it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, my, my point is just that the, the the critique of nationalism is not what you think of it, think it is, if you think it just means that like nations should basically uh you know bow before other nations on the basis of no particular principle. Um but just because of some higher allegiance, which is essentially national, like it's the same structure, but it's this allegiance to like the world as construed by powerful liberal elites. It's like, no, 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 that that's not what's happening here. Wherever there is real power already operative, it should be self-destructive in the sense of not for itself, but for others. Yeah. And wherever we see that not happening is precisely where the church says we need government because the church understands government precisely as a power of uh, uh, <laughs> the mode in which power is made for others and when we we don't even have a conception of this we don't have a language for this because we think of all government as simply power for itself or for some select interest group well i think at this you know point I mean? we kind of think of, of government as some bureaucratic system in which things are officiated and there's some general sense of representation yeah whereas and and that's something that can be steered wrong yeah you know and right. whereas with a company well it's just a whole bunch of free actors sure. who have their power because other people give it to them. Well, obviously that's true, but once you become so institutionalized, so absolutized in society, then they can start to do whatever you want, whether you like it or not. And yeah. that's, and that's, I think the more, um, more, more damaging phenomenon. And it's the exact opposite of what, what kind of the American spirit is, is weary of is 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 kind of scared of is aware of like we're not on our guard on those things well this has been the yeah. tragedy of american politics which is that basically conservatives spent however many years giving big hoorays for capitalism and corporations and <laughs> and globalism and then now suddenly as that worked and so <laughs> we have a uh, powerful american-led but ultimately globally interested corporations as a real source of power obviously more effective than technical states there's like, a really good in-depth like analysis of that phenomenon wanted. in tucker carlson's book ship of fools oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's an it's really great he talks a lot about that about how conservatives hate globalism and they act like they've always hated it but they actually were the ones that established they it totally did yeah it's like right there it wasn't even that long ago <laughs> yeah i even think i remember them establishing it <laughs> yeah. no, it seems there. it was a friday yeah. <laughs> it was a friday i remember <laughs> it was a bad, bad george day. w bush got up and said 
yeah, it's like the but the liberating for me the liberating experience of Catholicism is that it applies principles to all of this be, precisely because it's a teacher and mother to the world. It's like looking at her children and saying, "Okay, I'm not making pronouncements on exactly what you're doing." She always says, "I'm not advising a particular social order, but if there is power, it should be for the weak." And wherever that is not being done, it's injustice and sin. And so they have the ability to free us from this um, idealization of any particular level of power or any kind of human construction of power and say, like, this comes with its unbreakable laws. All the world is divided mm -hmm. into nations. It always has been. That's, And we need to be, like, in a competition with other mm -hmm. nations that we win or something like that. Yeah. It's like these are frameworks you can only really break out of, it seems to me, with the um, teachings of the church which say, no, these are human constructions. They are for the purpose of creating virtue in persons or they are worthless and we should destroy them insofar as they are harmful to the production of virtue in, in persons. And so it's like a, it's a paradigm shift that I think is very liberating even on a personal level because you can freely take part in the church's work of turning power to the weak by doing it yourself. Um, and that, that I think is liberating is that you're not waiting on, you know, the nation to theoretically do the right thing here. You enact it now and you work for it at higher levels, but you have a, you always have efficacy. You always are able to work and pray for the ideal vision of, of the society, which is power turned towards the weak. Yep. Yeah. And if that's what you mean by nationalism, stop using the word nationalism. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's not <laughs> nationalism and words have power and you should use the right ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the exact opposite of Trump's thing. Nationalism. It's a good word. Use that word. To yes, say a lot. I'm, I'm literally a saying word. the opposite yeah, of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, the words mean things. You can't like people. It's so ironic to me when I started realizing that the, that like the far right was doing this and I had participated in it because one of the main things they complain about is the left redefining words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like one of the main complaints is like the left redefined racism from, I think people of different colors are worth less mm -hmm. to, I think there are differences. Mm -hmm. Like I, there is a, I say there is a difference there is now like, it's like, that's one of the main things they complain about is the redefinition of words or like, you know, I can think of all kinds of, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there were all kinds of them that we used to complain about. I mean, tolerance is one that you brought up. They redefined the word tolerance, right, right. but the, but the right does it too. Mm. And one of the main ones they've done it with is nationalism. Sure. Cause you hear them like, what does nationalism mean? And they'll say something like, you know, it's about families and it's like, uh, uh, <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> <laughs> I don't need to hear the rest of what you're going to say because it's incorrect. That's not what the word means. <laughs> well, Josiah, thanks so much for this time. This is awesome. I really yeah. appreciated. It was great. This. I think we, we sussed quite a bit and hopefully we can send a, a few more guys down your path. Let's well. do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really hope so. Um, yeah. Cool. All awesome. Right. Well, join us next time. We'll see you in the same studio. Bye. Goodbye. Adios. <laughs> cool beans. <laughs> <laughs>